Welcome to this service of the Des Moines United Methodist Church. As always, we are so glad to have you join us this morning. This week, the pledge letters went out along with your pledge cards. So if you haven't received yours, please contact the church office either through email or by giving them a call and we will make sure to get it to you. We would like them in as soon as possible. Also this week, we are asking for some special prayers. Prayers for Larry Malcolm's family. Larry passed away this last Monday. Prayers also for Alice Wishman, who had a severe stroke and is in the hospital. And prayers for all those who are experiencing difficulties, whether it be financial, uh, emotional, or health issues. So let us keep one another in our prayers as we go throughout the week. Welcome. Grant, O oh God, that we may be faithful stewards of all that you have entrusted to us. May humanity exercise dominion over the earth, not to exploit or abuse, but to see that your will be done. Through the stewardship of your people, may you look once more at your creation and say, it is good, through the grace of Jesus. Amen. My name is Terry, and I welcome you to Time with Young People. I am so happy you chose to spend time with us today. We're going to talk a bit this morning about friends. Who are some of your friends? All friends are great, but we are closer to some friends than others. I'm thinking of the really good friends, the ones who we like to be with the most, the ones who we can share our joys and our troubles with, the ones who like us for who we are on our bad days as well as our good days. Here's a friend of mine. This picture is of one of my good friends. Actually, she's my best friend. She's also my wife. This is Jane. We met at work, fell in love, and have been married for 34 years. Like all good friends, Jane helps me be the best that I can be. One of the stories in the Bible is about a woman of ancient Israel who was a very wise and brave leader. Her name was Deborah. One of the military men who worked with Deborah was a man named Barak. Barak was strong and very skilled as a soldier, but he lacked something important, confidence. He wasn't sure of himself. Part of the story tells of how Deborah stood with Barak and believed in him. She agreed to go with him into an extremely difficult situation. Deborah's presence helped Barak have the confidence to do what he needed to do. Deborah was a good friend to Barak. She helped him be all that he could be. We all need friends like Deborah. We need friends who believe in us and help us believe in ourselves. Sometimes we find friends like that in our church family. Who are some of the people we know in church who are that kind of friend? Let's give thanks to God for all our friends in our schools and communities and in our church family. Who, those friends who love us and believe in us and help us be all that we can be. Let's pray together. Generous God, we give you thanks for good friends who believe in us. Help us to be good friends too. Amen. Have, have a great day, a great week. Thanks for being here. Be a good friend.
Hi, I'm Destiny, one of the youth here at Des Moines United Methodist Church, and I'd like to talk to you today about how I think the church has personally changed me, and how I think it can honestly help you too. So, as I said previously, I am one of the members of the youth group here, and this is actually the way I was introduced to the church, through the youth group. And I came here because I was homeschooled, and my mom saw a flyer at the food bank and said, Wow, these people sound really cool. Why don't we bring her here for some team building and socialization skills? And so she did. And it was one of the best things to ever have happened to me. Ever. <laughs> Not only have I grown more confident over the years, but with the help of my loving companions, may I say family, I have grown more confident and learned so many valuable lessons, not only from the youth group, not just on mission trips, but as a whole congregation. And I feel that our entire church, even during this pandemic, is striving to keep all of its members mentally healthy, happy, and growing in the way of Jesus. I know we're all struggling during this pandemic, so that's why I ask, if you can, to please donate to our church. It means the world to the people that need it the most. And just know that our donations are going to the people that need it the most. From the bottom of my heart, these people that are getting these donations are people who are either in the hospital or need more f money for food or something like that so i just want to say this but after all if hundreds of people add just one penny a day to the jar one day that jar will be full of hundreds of dollars and so whether it be for medical expenses or for food supplies so be it just know that your donations will go to the people that need it the most our church, our, ah, our church helps all people in body, mind, and spirit. And whether you need food, like I did from the food bank, or whether you need financial support when the going gets tough, just know that we are here to lend a helping hand. And so please be another hand and give a donation. Thank you so much and God bless. Scriptures for Stewardship Sunday. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy, in proportion to our faith, in service, in our serving. The one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in her exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Blessed be beloved God, the Holy One of mercy and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort which we ourselves are comforted by God. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. 
do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, do everything in love. Today, I want to tell you a story, almost like a fairy tale, where someone wins against all odds. I invite you to curl up as I am by my fireside and get into story time mood. This will also be a participatory experience. Whenever you hear the name Haman, I want you to boo loudly. So here we go. Once there was a king who ruled the whole world all the way from India to Ethiopia. His name was Ahusarius. Ahusarius, oh, how many times I've had to practice saying that name, is better known as Xerxes. He has the distinction of being the only person in the Bible whose name begins with X. There's not much else you can say for Xerxes. He was something of a buffoon, a blowhard, and a show-off. On one occasion, King Xerxes decides to throw a party big enough to make Mardi Gras look like a nursery tea. He invites not only everybody who is anybody, but everybody who is nobody, too. As far as expense goes, the sky's the limit. It is to last for seven days, and the palace is turned upside down, getting ready for it. New blue curtains are hung in all the windows, 
Silver couches are moved in by the cartload. Drinks are served in goblets of pure gold. Queen Vashti decides that the men shouldn't be the only ones to enjoy themselves, so she throws a party of her own and invites all the women. By the time the seventh day rolls around, the king is feeling no pain. Having shown off his other treasures, he decides it is time to show off Queen Vashti, too. She's quite a beauty, and he wants to see the gang turn green with envy when he parades her around. He sends word for her to get down there in a hurry. But on the grounds that she is a human being rather than a gold goblet or a silver couch, and that being a woman is as good as being a man any day, she refuses to be trotted out as a plaything and turns the king down flat. Xerxes is fit to be tied. Not only has he been insulted, but if Vashti is allowed to get away with this, who could tell what the women will be asking for next? They might want to vote. Xerxes divorces her on the spot. Queen Vashti loses her throne, but keeps her self-respect. All things considered, she made the right choice. The king then sends out a royal decree and orders that the prettiest women from all of the 127 provinces be paraded before him so he might select the loveliest as his queen. He chooses Esther. The king does not know it at the time, but Esther is an orphan, a Jew in the care of her uncle Mordecai. When Xerxes chooses Esther, she is put in a real dilemma she is a Jew who worships the true and living God, the God of Israel. But here in this pagan king is demanding that she marry him. Her wise uncle Mordecai advises Esther to marry the king, even though he is not of her faith or her people. Besides, Esther is a poor nobody, a woman, and Xerxes is a king. In the socioeconomic, gender-based, class-dependent economic power structures of the day, what can she do? Now things get really somber. Enter the bad man. In the king's employ is a wicked toady named Haman. He isn't only a bureaucrat, and you know we all can't stand bureaucrats, he is a very wicked bureaucrat. Haman hates Jews, seeing Jews as foreigners, aliens who can never be trusted to be loyal subjects to the king. I'll get rid of all the Jews, thinks Haman. We'll never have a secure empire as long as we have these immigrants, these foreigners who are more loyal to their foreign god than they are to the king. So Haman plots for the mass executions of all the Jews. In good little toady, bureaucratic, kiss-up fashion, Haman slithers up to the king and says, Dear king, it has come to our attention that there is a certain ethnic group in your kingdom who consider themselves above your laws. Although inclusiveness and ethnic diversity are otherwise good things, King, you know that rules are rules. I would be glad to assist my king in destroying all these disloyal subjects. Haman's argument makes good managerial sense to the king, so Xerxes agrees and orders that on the 13th of Adar, all Jews will be slain. You can imagine the weeping and wailing that takes place among the Jews who hear of this genocidal plan. When Mordecai hears about Haman's plan, he immediately sends word to Queen Esther. 
in the palace and begs her to remember her people and to help save them. Who knows, he asks. Maybe you have been put in the palace for such a time as this. Esther reminds Mordecai of the palace rules. Nobody, even the queen, can just show up expecting an appointment with the king. In response, Mordecai reminds Esther that she is the only hope of her people. Esther is in great fear. She lies awake, tossing and turning all night for three nights. She is only one person. She knows that she could go before the king, be, uh, he could be angry, and he would instantly have her put to death. Finally, she decides that she will go, saying, if I die, I shall die. Esther enters the grand throne room. She is terrified, yet the king bids her to speak. Dear king, she says, would you grant to me just one little favor? Well, just name it, says the king, even half my kingdom, whatever. Esther is showing forth her beauty, turning on her charm, and doing all she can to ingratiate herself to the king. Would you and your trusted Haman do me the honor of attending a great dinner with me? It just wouldn't be right without the two of you. Haman, when he learns of the invitation, puffs up with pride that he is being invited up to the big house for a grand party. This surely must mean that he is moving right up the ladder of bureaucrats, right to the top. Esther spends the whole next day wondering how in the world she is going to talk to the king about Haman's evil plot against the Jews. How will the king react? The banquet is a glorious event, but throughout the whole evening, Esther just can't bring herself to speak to the king about the plight of the Jews, her people. At the end of the banquet, Esther announces that everything has been so wonderful that she has decided that they simply must have another grand banquet on the very next night. Please, 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 can the king and Haman come? They gladly agree. The next evening, things are going so great that King Xerxes announces to the whole gathering, Esther, you are such a great queen, such a great hostess. Tell me what would make you happy. Ask anything, and it is yours. Esther seizes the opportunity and somehow finds the courage to say, Dear lovable king, there is an evil man in this palace who wants to kill me and those whom I love. Let me and my people live. That's all I ask. Well, who wants to do a terrible, stupid thing like that? Asked the king. He's over there, she says, the sniveling little toady forth from the right. Haman is stunned. He hasn't taken the trouble to find out if Esther is Jewish. The king orders Haman to be taken out and hanged on the very gallows Haman had been preparing for old Mordecai and his fellow Jews. Note that I haven't mentioned God up to this point in the story. It is a story about God, but in a sort of roundabout way. First, it's a story about a savvy woman who had laid aside her own safety and has spoken up for her people, saving them when they were imperiled in a foreign land. Curiously, God is never explicitly mentioned 
in the entire book of Esther. This is the one book of the Bible where God doesn't speak or intervene or outwardly do anything. But I think it's still a story about God, about the way that God sometimes works behind the scenes lovingly and creatively to accomplish God's purposes. How? Through the faithfulness and courage of ordinary people like Esther. True, Esther was a real hero, but she was a reluctant hero. Ultimately, she did a great deed for her people, but she took small, hesitant steps on the way there. She didn't start out wanting to be anyone's hero. She's assimilated herself into the dominant culture, married a pagan king, and blended in to such a degree that most of her people probably thought she had given away the store, had allowed herself to be so thoroughly enmeshed in pagan culture that she was no longer a Jew. As a woman, she had little power, even though she was queen. Yet Esther used what power she had, maneuvered skillfully within the limits imposed upon her by the culture, and did a great thing. She acted as a faithful Jew, a faithful daughter of Israel. When the time came for her to show what she was made of and who she was deep down. What Esther did was not particularly spectacular, but that's what makes this a good story, because most of us are not very spectacular people. Few of us have been witnesses to spectacular, breathtakingly stunning acts of Almighty God. But that's okay, because most of the good God needs doing is not too spectacular. Someday, some of you may be forced to give your life for your faith, but that's not very likely. Not because we are lucky enough to live in a culture where it is now safe to be a Christian, but because our world has found a way of whittling down the church and the faithful a little bit at a time. So one day we wake up and non-evangelical Christians have been marginalized. Some of you might be required to stand up to the gallows and testify that Jesus is Lord, but more likely you will be at a fancy dinner party and someone will make a wise crack, putting down somebody, or someone will advocate some behavior that is less than Christian, and it's then that you will be required to find a way to speak up and speak out for what you believe, doing your bit part in the salvation and preservation of God's people. You and I may be in a world more like Esther's than we admit. Esther was in an unprecedented time in her world. We are living in the time of COVID a pandemic that is not abating, but surging. And we wonder what we can possibly do to make it better. Yeah, I know, wear a mask, wash your hands, socially distant. But after eight months, we have COVID fatigue or are around people who are. Do we say things to people who aren't taking any of the safety measures? We, like Esther, are strangers in a strange land of pandemic. Esther was in a time of persecution. And some of you here, even here, are beginning to feel a bit strange as a Christian. We live in a society that for all of its virtues, neither worships nor obeys our God. The motto of our age is not, what does the Lord require, but rather, what do I have to do to get along? It's so easy to comfort ourselves with, I'm no martyr. I'm just one little person. What can I do? 
Why do you tithe to the church? I asked a group of people. Some people cited the inherent need to be generous. Others said that they contributed money to the work of the church out of a sense of gratitude for all the good gifts that God had given them. I gave out of defiance, said one young businessman. Defiance, I asked? Yep, when the plate is passed and I put my money in, it's my little act of defiance. I put in about 50 hours a week in my business. Most of my life is consumed with making my business work and in getting more money for my family and me. So when I contribute, it's my, it's my clinch-fisted way of saying, you don't have all of me yet. There is still 10% of me that's free, that belongs to God rather than to the world. I know 10% isn't a whole lot of money, but it's a start. Real change, great revolutionary events begin in defiance. Think of the offering each Sunday as a small act of defiance in the name of Jesus. In this time of pandemic, uncertainty, anxiety, and fatigue, we keep going, struggling to make sense of the over 240,000 people in this country who have died in these last eight months. We need Christianity, the church, to be a beacon of hope and light. The church needs our support so that it is here when people find themselves walking in the darkness of pandemic. We are here for such a time as this, a time that needs us to be all in, in prayer, in service, in witness, and in our pledges and gifts that will fully say with the young businessman that the world and its despair cannot have us. We are all in as followers of Jesus, living the way of Jesus. What can I do? I tell you, looking through the lens of this ancient fairy tale-like story, that the grand beloved community is being advanced and preserved through the good work of ordinary, unspectacular folk like us. That's the way our God works. God doesn't do it all. God enlists and strengthens ordinary people like you, like me, to do God's good work. So you come to some point in your life, either at work, at the office, at school, or at a banquet, where there is the opportunity for you to step up, to speak out, and it is, it is as if old Mordecai says to you, what he said to Esther. Who knows? Maybe the Lord is calling you for such a time as this.
into the world with faith, trusting all to receive you. Go into the world with hope and God's will before you and great dreams in your heart. Go into the world with love, love for all people, serving with those in whom Jesus lives and laboring for those whom Jesus came. And the faithfulness of God, the hope which quickens God's spirit within us, and the love of Jesus be with us all. Amen.